Shalom everyone. This is Minister Nick Gentile, Lord in Christ Ministries, and I'm here with a dear brother in the Lord from Nigeria. I discovered Brother David on Facebook after finding some of his posts about the targeted slaughter and persecution of our brothers and sisters in Christ in Nigeria. I shared a number of those posts and then sent him a friend request. He responded and then shortly after that I sent him a request to do an interview, to dialogue, or to have a conversation because I felt compelled by the Lord to give him a platform to talk about what Christians are being subjected to in Nigeria today. He graciously agreed to accommodate me by doing this interview and to have our conversation recorded so that we can raise awareness about the bloodbath that's taking place in Nigeria. Although this brother isn't currently in Nigeria, as the Lord has called him to do missions work in the Ivory Coast and a neighboring West African country, he's had loved ones killed by these Muslim persecutors. He's had Muslims killed by these Muslim per He's had loved ones killed by these Muslim persecutors, and so this issue has definitely hit close to home for this brother, touching him in a very intimate way, in a way that those of us in the West cannot understand. So without further ado, Thank you, dear brother, for agreeing to do this interview. Thank you, brother Nick. I'm grateful uh, that you have, you have me here this, this evening. I appreciate it. Amen. So, brother, um, I just want to start off with you providing whatever introductory information about yourself that you feel comfortable sharing with those that are going to hear this conversation. So anything about your upbringing, uh, where you're from, you know, your, how you became a Christian, that type of thing. You know, did you grow up in a Christian family? Stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. I, I was born in, in Jos, in Nigeria, central Nigeria, in the area that is generally called the Middle Belt or the Bible Belt. It is the, the area covering about five or six states where most of the Western missionaries that came in the 1800s settled down and began to work and began to build the mission work which spread across the north and south of Nigeria. And so it's called the Middle Belt, it's called the, the Bible Belt. Uh, now that's where I was born. I, I was born and brought up uh, and there, but the, we had uh, also, we had Muslims around us, so we grew up knowing them and relating with them. Uh, we are not totally ignorant of, of, of who they are. We knew them, we related with them, but basically, we, we grew up as Christians in a, a Christian-dominated area. I was born and raised by parents who didn't go to school, but they, they loved the Lord. They knew the Lord. They found the Lord even before they got married. And we were all brought up in the faith, uh, in the understanding of the Lord. But at the age of 10, about 10 of years, uh, in 1981, I found the Lord. I, I attended a youth meeting where I gave my heart to the Lord. And since then, I've grown up working with God and, uh, you know, when, when I was in, 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 in school, when I was in my tertiary education, I, I didn't found, the, the, the found out that I had a call of God upon my life. And uh, as soon as I graduated, I went into ministry. And I've been serving the Lord uh, since uh, 1990. But I've been in the mission field uh, uh, since uh, 1995. You know, I served in the Ivory Coast, went back and served in Nigeria and then served in Ghana for about 14 years before coming back again to the, to the Ivory Coast, or the Côte d'Ivoire, as it's called in French. So basically, that's uh, everything that you need to possibly know about me. Okay, great, wonderful. Uh, so tell those of us outside of Nigeria, and even outside of the regions where Christians are being targeted for extreme persecution, what is going on right now? You know, and who's responsible for these attacks? And what regions in Nigeria are these attacks primarily taking place? And be as specific as possible, brother. Okay. Basically, what's going on now is a targeted, uh, well-planned, uh, well-executed plan to, to wipe out Christianity, to, to reduce the impact of Christianity in Nigeria, to, to make that particular area called the Bible Belt or the Middle Belt, you know, to make, uh, to, to lessen the impact and the strength of Christianity because uh, the, the people who are targeting Christians are actually the Fulanis. 
the Fulani herdsmen. The Fulanis are uh, the descendants of the, the great old man, that Fodio, the man who who brought Islam to Nigeria, the, Cruz, the jihadists, uh, the great jihad uh, that brought uh, Islam to Nigeria. And his intention was to take Islam from the north of Nigeria down to the sea, which is down to the south. But somewhere around the middle belt in the area of Kaduna State, uh, uh, Adamawa State, uh, Plateau State, uh, uh, Benue State, Nasara State, all those areas, you know, they were strong and they were strong warriors and they stopped him. That's where the spread of Islam stopped. And they have always considered that they need to carry Islam down to the south. And they have looked for every opportunity to do it. But uh, now with, with, with uh, the failed political system in Nigeria, the corrupt political system, right now we, we have a president in Nigeria who is a Fulani. And who, who possibly may not be, be, be sponsoring these attacks, but his silence, his, his quietness concerning them, because they are his kinsmen who are carrying out these attacks, his quietness, you know, gives a, an impression that he is all along with it. Because the organization of the Fulanese that are carrying out all these attacks is called the Miete Allah. The Miete Allah is the organization of all the Fulanese. Uh, in, in, in West Africa, you know, they, they originated from the Republic of Guinea. And so, these particular people uh, in, in West Africa and, and, and in Nigeria particularly, and they are nomads, they, they, they travel from place to place, but they need a place where they can settle down and have some form of authority, you know, and, and possibly Nigeria is a better place for them. You know, and so these attacks are orchestrated and planned deliberately to, uh, you know, wipe out Christianity, drive the villagers who are basically farmers and Christians, and then take over their farm lands. In the last 10 days to 12 days, they have been, you know, and, and uh, a heightened level of well organized attack by these herdsmen who are uh, not, who are not educated, but they are well armed with AK 47s, you know. And they are well armed, they go to villages, attack people in the night while they sleep, they, ma they use machetes and guns and gun them down and machete them and cut children to pieces, you know, cut through pregnant women and rip out the babies from their womb. And they go to churches, kill pastors, burn down the churches. This is, is, this is uh, unbelievable. It's unbelievable the kind of evil that has been done. People are dying and then the, 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 the government is, is just quiet, you know, the government is quiet, doing their best to hide what is happening, you know, and, you know, hindering villagers from burying their loved ones so that they can, you know, just carry the, the, the bring together those corpses and bury them in mass graves without identity. This is evil. This is purely evil going on there. Yeah, and that was going to be really my next uh, question. Um, what part, if any, is the government and President Muhammadu Bukhari and the military and the military responsible for are complicit in these targeted, calculated attacks upon the Christians in Jos and other parts of Nigeria? But I think you hit the nail on the head with that. So well, you see, there are two problems that. Yeah, go ahead, sir, brother. Yeah, yeah, there are two basic problems there. You know, before you could solve a problem, you must identify what the problem is. You know, the government has been giving conflicting, you know, accounts. On one hand, they said this, uh, uh, they said this, this herdsmen just need uh, grazing fields. They need a place where they can graze and feed their cattle. And then, then another time, the, the president comes up and says, no, that the killers are foreigners. Foreigners that came from Libya after the crisis in Libya, you know. And, and so these conflicting reports, you know, and in these attacks that keep reoccurring and re reoccurring and reoccurring, just within uh, between uh, 2016 and 2017, there were over 80 attacks. 80 attacks, you know, I mean, and 
Why will these things keep repeating and happening and repeating and nobody's brought to justice, nobody's caught, nobody's arrested? And then we have a government that went to Sierra Leone and defended Sierra Leone and, and, and fought, you know, we, we have a government that went to Liberia and fought the war in Liberia single-handedly. Why would we solve conflicts in other countries in West Africa? And then common hearts men who are not educated, who are not trained in the military, uh, why, why would they keep killing people, innocent people, innocent citizens, even citizens who voted Buhari into power, you know. So we, we, there is this general unease and disagreement, and Christians wholeheartedly in Nigeria believe that the federal government and even the state governments are com complicit in the, in the attacks that are taking place. Yeah, it's horrible, absolutely horrible. Now, what measures would you like to see the government and military take to protect Christians in Nigeria from the attacks of the Fulani Muslim herdsmen, Boko Haram, and Islamic terrorist terrorism in general? Uh, basically, there are a few things that uh, are in the minds of every Nigerian. Everybody believes that the federal government is capable of stopping these attacks and protecting lives and properties. Every Nigerian should live peacefully. No Christian gets up to attack a Muslim. Christians don't have problem attacking Muslims. We are a peaceful, loving people. And Christians want just these attacks to stop. Every Nigerian should be treated equally. No Nigerian should uh, uh, be subjected to attacks and harassment and being killed at night. That's what every Nigeria wants. And then we also want to see justice. We want to see the federal government get up and do its job, uh, uh, arrest the people who are doing it. The federal government knows who is doing this. They know who is arming them. There is no way arms will come into Nigeria and nobody knows it. AK-47s in large quantities, killers are, uh, you know, people organize in, in, in thousands to go and kill. There is no way the federal government does not know or cannot know what's going on. So. The government should get up and do its job and care for the people, be compassionate, protect the same people that voted them into power, and love every Nigeria, give every Nigeria peace and security. We also want to see that the villages, that the people that have been killed, villages that have been you know, ransacked and people driven away, we want to see the federal government restore them, build back these communities, and then, you know, and let these people go back to their ancestral homeland. This is their homeland. This is their ancestral home. You know, years of, of archaeology and, and all kinds of works that are evident that these people have lived in that village. My village was attacked and my relatives were killed. About 32 people were killed and they were buried in a mass grave. That's my village where my ancestors have been there since the 1800s. I went there. We, we, we have everything. We have everything there. Everything that, that they left behind, you know, because they lived on the rocks in the mountains. So we want to see people live peacefully in their homeland. We, we don't want the will of a particular ethnic group imposed on the others. We just want peace in Nigeria, you know. And the federal government, you know, one of the major problems that Nigerians have is that the federal government, the, the composition of the security system of the federal government of Nigeria is basically in the hands of one ethnic group, the Fulanis. The National you know, Defense, uh, uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, you know, uh, uh, National Security Agency, and all the, the police, the customs, the immigration, are all in the control of one ethnic group. Why should it be so? The police. Why should it be so? According to the Constitution of Nigeria, the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria, there should be a representation, what they call the federal character, which means that people from different ethnic groups all over Nigeria should be represented in every leadership level in, of Nigeria. It, it has never happened in Nigeria where a particular ethnic group is in charge of the whole security apparatus of the country. This is, this is unheard of. This is, this, is, this, this is wrong, completely wrong. So we want to see all these things, and then we want to see the federal government reach out to the victims, to the to the to the to the refugees, to the to the the, the, the orphans that are left behind, and the widows, and, and, and take care of them. People are sleeping outside. People are sleeping in the cold. Just it's a very cold place. 
people are sleeping in the bed. One of the one of the IDP comes, you know, one of the IDP, IDP comes by the airport has about three thousand people, and the government. I, I learned that the people have only eighty mattresses. Now, how do people sleep in that cold on the floor? And these attacks have taken place for about two weeks. That's quite a long time. People are suffering. We want to see the government get up and do their job. That's all. Do their job. And we, we have a big uh, uh, military base in Jaws. We have the police. And yet, you know, every time this attack repeats, and we don't see the military go out there and, and act immediately. So we want to see Nigeria working. We want to see the government doing its job. Doing its job as well. That's all. Nobody's asking for more than that. Let everybody be in peace, at peace, security protected let them live their lives amen absolutely now yes, what can christians in america and the west as a whole do to help our persecuted brothers and sisters in nigeria what action should we oh, take yes absolutely there is a lot that needs to be done first of all is awareness the nigerian church the african church actually the western church has no idea what's going on and I keep saying this for a long time. Why does the church depend on liberal media, on, on CNN, on BBC to be informed? Why? The church should have its own media, media that informs the church about the realities of what's going on on the ground. I think that Christians, you know, if you look at scripture, uh, at a particular time in Antioch, when the church in Jerusalem was going to famine, the Apostle Paul, the great man of God, was able to raise support and send it to Jerusalem to support the brothers and sisters there in the time of famine. I think that the church should wake up to the fact that we are one. This is the body of Christ. We all belong to each other. If our brothers in Pakistan are attacked, they are our brothers. If our brothers in Brazil are attacked, they are our brothers. And our brothers in Nigeria are going through a lot of difficulties and attacks. They are our brothers. But we need to first of all know what's going on. We need to be informed. I think that's the first step that the church needs to do. We need to have a proper information about what's going on with the body of Christ all over the world. Secondly, I think also prayer is the second thing. We need to pray for those who are afflicted. We need to pray for persecuted Christians in Africa, in Egypt, in Nigeria, in different areas where Christians are going through a lot. Christians are going through a lot. And you know, so we need to pray for them. We need to pray. And when we pray, we need to also rise up and support them. Churches have been destroyed. We can rebuild them. Communities have been destroyed. It won't take much. You know, there is just a little of the giving of offerings that we can do, that we can rebuild these communities back. They'll go back to their lives. Orphans are left behind. Women are left widows. And they have children that they cannot afford to raise. Their farmlands are destroyed. For example, this year. on their farmland, feeding their... You know, when the cameras are turned off, when everybody is gone, they will be left with a year without food, with nothing. How will they survive? How are they going to send their children to school? I think that we as a church, and the church in the West, should rise up and help and build the church in Africa. Uh, and then we, we need to... We, uh, uh, Christians in the West, we, we need to... You need to actually come over and have a look, you know, visit the African church. Come and see what's going on. Visit the church, encourage the church, strengthen the church. And then finally, I will say, what I am doing and what many other young people are doing is we are local indigenous missionaries. We, we are in an age now that we don't have to wait for white people to bring the gospel to Africa anymore. The church in Africa is growing. And there are young people who are willing to go into the field and harvest the souls. You know, we just need support. We need the church in the West to stand with us. We need the church in the West to support us, to say, go, go to the field. We'll support you. We will, we will give. We will pray. We will assist you. We will, we will give you the, the necessary support that you need. 
so that this work can be done. The Bible says Jesus will not come back unless the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the earth. And I think that the Western church uh, uh, should, should really look at that aspect of it and you know, get to know missionaries in the field, get to assist them, get to visit them, come down and look at the work that is doing. One of the things that we in Africa uh, have that uh, probably you don't have in the West, we don't have problem with questions about God. We don't, uh, Africans don't question whether God is there or not. They know God exists. They know God exists. So their hearts are right. They want to know who is this God. They don't have problem about believing whether God exists or not. I think it's a big harvest field that we need to reach out to them, right in Ivory Coast where I'm working, and in certain other countries in West Africa, the Muslims are open to the gospel. They want to hear about Christ. We have Muslims just giving their hearts to Christ without any, without any hard work, without any challenge, you know. But we need to be empowered. We need to be supported. We need to rise up and to reach out to them. I think that the harvest is truly ripe, as Jesus said. But we need laborers to go into the field. That's what we need right now. So, basically, I think that these are the things that the church in the West, Western Christians, should look at and really get up and act on it immediately. Amen, brother. I wholeheartedly agree with you. And that's one of the main reasons I wanted to interview you is to get out your perspective on what we in the West can do to help our brothers and sisters in Nigeria. And it's good that you mentioned to, it's good that you also mentioned supporting brothers and sisters everywhere around the world, no matter where they are, who are being persecuted. Because in every country on this planet, uh, where Christians, Absolutely. especially our minority, they're persecuted. It, it's part yes. for the course. Jesus said this would happen. And so it's not a surprise if we know the Word of God. Um, but what do, you, what do you think about organizations like Open Doors, Voice of the Martyrs, International Christian Concern, and the like? Do you think that those are good organizations to support? Do they really provide aid for brothers and sisters that are being persecuted? Or should we go in another direction and... Do our, like I have my own thing I'm doing, but do you think those are good organizations to support, in your opinion? Yeah, uh, well, I just had a little about Open Doors. I don't know much about them. Okay. Uh, I don't also know much about many organizations who are working in Africa, but because for me, from my, my own years, 23 years of working in West Africa, I have not come across any of them. So probably they are helping, but I don't know how they are helping. Because when we see disasters like this, uh, we, we, know, we don't see the help. Sometimes one of the problems that we have is that they reach the wrong people. Uh, and sometimes support is sent, but it doesn't get down to the people on the ground who really are bearing the brunt of the pain and the suffering. I have been involved in, uh, in, in missions, in rural evangelism. We go to villages, we carry out medical uh, supplies to help people. I've not come across any of these organizations. We've had a few friends in the United States who will send us $100, $50 to support our outreaches. But we, we wish that. I'm not saying they are not working. I'm saying probably they should be out there more. They should uh, reach out to people on the field, people who are working among those rural people. Uh, but also, I, I don't also want us to limit ourselves to these organizations. I really feel that if the church in the West gets up and and become, like I talked about, awareness, being aware of what is really happening, you know, getting proper information on what's going on down there, and those who are prepared, to, those who are in the field working, you know, I believe that will have a, a greater impact. I believe that will have a greater impact. Some of these uh, well-established charity, Christian charity organizations, you know, contact churches that are already establishment churches. And those establishment churches, you know, have their reach just within their churches, where their churches are. They don't have missionaries out in the field. They don't come to the field where we are. So I believe that we should find a, a very workable, you know, a, a pattern and system in which we can actually get down to the people who are out there in the field. We went to a rural community last year, and we went with a, a medical doctor, one doctor, and we worked there for about three days. The local chief was crying and he said he has never seen anything like that. 
all his life. He's an elderly man. He's never seen anything. He's never seen in Ivory Coast where an organization comes and goes to a village and they're taking care of people, taking care of the sick, giving out drugs free of charge. That he's never seen it. That was the first time in his life. I think that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. But I think that also we should contact people on the ground, missionaries who are genuinely on the ground. Some of them are independent missionaries, you know, and nobody knows about them. But nobody cares actually to know about them. So basically, I think that that's one other direction that we need to look into. Amen. Um, now, how can people personally support you and the work you're doing on the mission field? Okay. Um, in Africa, we have problem with online payment, you know, like PayPal, you know, because the, the financial system in Africa has not yet caught up with the global economy, you know. So the, the basic way that we receive any form of support is actually through uh, Western Union or sometimes friends of ours put up GoFundMe on, online and then a few people that know about or support us. But uh, that's why I was saying that it's very good uh, they, it's very good that we contact, uh, you know, if you can get a contact of a mission, for example, my ministry, if people get contact with us, you know, and they get to know us, and they'll find better ways of sending out support. You know, there are bank transfers that are a bit uh, uh, difficult, but they work, they work, you know, you can make bank transfers, you can make proper support, you can send down, not just financially, but even material things, you know, equipment, school uh, school supplies, you know, to the mission field, clothes for people in the, in, the, in, the, in the rural areas, and there are many other ways of support. But basically, if you get into contact with the missionary, there is a better way of organizing and arranging how supports can be sent down. And what's the name of your organization, and how can people find out more about it? Uh, my organization is the World Mission Center, and I'm of the Speak to the Nations Ministries, World Mission Center. It is based here in Abidjan, Ivory Coast, in, in, in the capital of Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, Abidjan. Uh, World Mission Center, we, we, we are basically on Facebook. Uh, there is a page, uh, World Mission Center, where a lot of our activity, almost every aspect about our activity is published on Facebook, World Mission Center. We also have a blog, worldmissionsafrica.blogspot.com, you know, worldmissionsafrica.blogspot.com. And then we have an email, updates at worldmissions at gmail.com, you know. So basically, these are the... The, the process in which we can get into contact and people can also see what we are doing in the field. And I will be providing links to each of the things that Brother David mentioned for those who tune into this in the description section of this video. So don't worry, I will make sure that I make it as easy as possible for you guys to find out more about his ministry, the organization he's associated with, and uh, what the Lord is doing through his ministry, the ministry of the Lord has raised them up to start for his glory. Um, now, what would you like to see the Trump administration and our, our government as a whole do in Nigeria? What what can they do? What should they do to, uh, you know, counteract what's going on in the persecution of Christians? Um, what, In your opinion, what, what can our government do? A question. Uh a lot of people in the West have no idea what influence Western powers have upon uh, African countries. There is so much influence, so much power that they can have on African countries. And uh, when, when, a, a few months ago, I think in April, President Mohamed Buhari was, was in, in, in Washington, D.C. He, he had uh, an invitation from uh, President uh, Donald Trump. And uh, I, I remember very well in, in, in that meeting, President Trump said something. He said, uh, the, America, uh, the United States of America will not stand by and see Christians slaughtered, continue to be slaughtered in Nigeria. That was a very, very powerful statement he made. Now we really want to see him carry out, you know, that, st that statement. We want to see treasure mounted on the federal government of Nigeria. There are many things that 
the Trump administration, the Western powers can do is to demand accountability, demand that the killings end, demand that there is, there is an end to this killing. And I would like to see also Christians and, and politicians, uh, the United States senators, you know, and, and members of Congress, you know, really uh, uh, speak out and, and, and uh, speak, send a message to the government of Nigeria. The government of Nigeria listens. They will listen. African governments listen. And they need to speak and, and speak clearly, you know, uh, and say what they actually really mean. You know, if, they, if the government uh, of the United States speaks, absolutely it will have great impact and the government of Nigeria will sit up and do their job. And uh, we, we hope that they will help us. Now, do you have a message in case President Trump does hear this recording, does hear this conversation or this interview, this dialogue? Do you have a message for President Trump, for Nikki Haley, for people in our government that may hear this? Absolutely. I have a message for them. I want to remind them that the United States of America has always been a force of, uh, the for the protection of liberties around the world, the protection of lives and properties on democracies. Uh, and, and, and liberties, you know, the United States of America has conscience. They speak for the weak. They defend the weak. And they've done a lot for many countries, and they have done a lot for Nigeria. But God has placed the United States in a place where it is so that it can serve for his purpose. I just want to encourage them, and I want to tell them that we are looking up to them. We need their help. They have the ability to do it. They can help us. They can help Christians. They can help Christians around the world. They can help Christians in Nigeria. The only power that can actually stop this on earth, I believe, is the resolve of the United States government. I believe that if they stand up to the government of Nigeria, there will be an immediate, an immediate action taken. And you will see peace restored to Nigeria as soon as possible. Now, quickly, brother, would you quickly like to talk about the fundraiser on Facebook? I don't know if you know too much about this, but I saw that fundraiser that was created by uh, Sister Kimberly Miller. Do you know much about that fundraiser? And if you do, would you like to talk about that? Yes, yes. Uh, Kimberly is a friend of mine on Facebook. Actually, we became friends just two days before this attack happened, and she was very interested. And she was asking me, why is it that nobody has set up a GoFundMe for relief? And I told her, well, you see, uh, that's the question, and you're asking, because, you know, that's what people should be asking. And she set up that fundraiser. We've been in contact communication constantly with her. Uh, the intention was if we could raise some support, probably even in, in thousands of, of, of dollars to help, because there are over 11,000 people suffering, sleeping in the cold, in the rain. People are still running and sleeping in the bush, in the villages. And uh, she set up that go for me. Uh, it's been it's been encouraging actually because uh, a few days ago the go for me had raised about four hundred dollars, which she sent down to our affiliate uh, uh, representatives in Jaws, and they are working with it. So we are looking forward, honestly, that that go for me will do a lot of help. The people should contribute, give to it, donate willingly and generously. We know America as a generous nation. We are counting on their help. And we pray that they will rise up and help us at this time of need. And I will be providing a link to this fundraiser, and I'm going to be starting one myself. Do you know of anyone else or any other organization or ministry or individual that has created something like what Kimberly has that people can support to get immediate aid to our brothers and sisters who have suffered, who have been displaced from their homes, who are sleeping on the ground right now. Is there, are there other outlets besides what Kimberly has done that people can donate to immediately? Yes, I think there is a brother on Facebook, also a friend of ours that have created a GoFundMe. Uh, the, the purpose of it is to, to raise money so that they can, uh, he actually intended to go down there and train people on security matters, intelligence, how the local communities can actually take responsibility for defending themselves and keeping aware of their security of security. He's a veteran. He's a veteran. 
an American veteran, you know. And uh, I, I don't know how well it's going. I don't know how well it's going. But I, I know that there's a GoFundMe. I can provide you with a link later and uh, just help us. Okay. How can people pray for you specifically right now and your, your ministry? Yes. Uh, our ministry is doing a lot of work. The ground is quite ripe. The harvest is ready. We, we, we just need the help of the Lord, the strength of the Lord. We need support. We need, uh, we need dedicated. We, we, we could actually have more people on the field working, but we can't, for now, we can't afford to take care of them. I mean, staff, well, uh, staff welfare. So we really, and equipment for evangelism, vehicles, we, we don't have, a, we don't even have a single vehicle that takes us to the rural area. So we depend on local transportation, which sometimes fails or sometimes breaks down. Sometimes it's expensive. You know, uh, last year we were going to a rural community for an outreach, medical outreach, and uh, there was a uh, Muslim feast. So there was scarcity of transportation. You know, we, we stood at the bus station for over six hours waiting for a bus. You know, it was quite difficult. We need a vehicle. We need tents. We need resources just to go out there in the field and work. So we want our partners, our friends to pray with us that God will raise up support for us and God will empower us and grant us the boldness to reach out to rural villages. Some of these areas are very dangerous. Even as much as we hear about Nigeria, but it's, it's some of these rural communities are really risky, actually. We risk our lives. Some of them are still into witchcraft, idolatry, a lot of challenges, you know, uh, and uh, sometimes we are robbed, you know, uh, and all these, these things. Uh, we need, we need uh, prayer. We need prayer so that God will, will strengthen us and protect us, and God will open doors for us in the mission field. And how can people pray for Nigeria? Specifically, the government, the people, Muslims, Christians. What would you like people to pray there for? Two, yeah. Basically, there are two things that I would like people to pray for Nigeria. Number one, pray that these Muslims will find Christ. They need to find Christ. Jesus can take away the bitterness, the hatred, the murderous spirit in their hearts. We want them to know Christ. You know, one of the things that fuels all this anger sometimes is the, the, the number of Muslims that are turning to Christ. There are lots of Muslims in Nigeria turning to Christ and finding salvation, you know. And so we need to pray more for them so that they will find Christ and find salvation. We need to also pray that God will strengthen the church in Nigeria. The church in Nigeria is divided. The church in Nigeria is not united in this time of crisis some of them are not bold some of them are, are scared we need to pray that god will grant them boldness grant them unity spirit of unity you know an agreement so that they can work together stand together and preach the gospel without fear amen and i i know that one of the things that has infected nigeria from the united states is the prosperity gospel an issue is that in nigeria absolutely such a great issue we we have uh, we have pastors in Nigeria who are who are who are prosperous, fairly prosperous. We have churches that are building universities. You know, we have churches that have big auditoriums, large buildings. You know, but when crises come like this, you discover that there is no compassion for the needy. You see, everywhere is quiet. People are are, are quiet as the church is suffering. People are killed in villages. Uh, when, 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 when our focus as a church is not on discipleship and mission uh, and salvation of souls, when our focus is on money, on material things, the truth is that we will not have the compassion of Christ in our heart. It is absolutely true that a poor church cannot do much for the Lord, but money is never and should never be the focus of the church. Christ should be the focus of the church. The drive for every church should be to win souls, to disciple them for the Lord, to bring people might harvest into the kingdom. But actually, absolutely true, there has been a, a downward side of, of all this. You know, uh, people have become more materialistic. I mean, Christians become more materialistic and everybody is concerned about his own personal success. 
and you find out that Christ is not in their heart. Amen. So you see that, a just like in the United States, although the persecution of Christians here is nowhere near, and I wouldn't even call it persecution, I would just call it opposition here in, in the West. It's not at the level of persecution yet. But you see that contrast uh, in Nigeria and in the States in that you have great prosperity and then you have great poverty yeah. side by side. Yeah. And it's just, you, you have those that are not serious about winning souls to Christ by the grace of God in both places. Absolutely. And then you have those that are hungry to win souls to Christ that are going into the highways and the byways and compelling people to come into the Father's house, share, preaching the gospel, risking all for Christ. And so we have to pray, guys, that the Lord will put an end to that, uh, that he will sift the wheat from the tares, the tares from the wheat. And, uh, you know, yeah. that great falling away, although we look at it as a negative thing, is actually a positive thing because it's the Lord pruning. Yes, it is. The church needs to be purified. Yes. We need to be purged. So, so uh, pray for that, guys. Pray that uh, the real, like in Gideon's army, the real men and even say women of God will rise up in Nigeria and will go out into the highways and the byways because it's the gospel that are going to tra that's going to transform Nigeria. That's going to change the heart of Muslims. It's the only thing that can change their heart. And I will say this: people who want to say, "Well, it's not Islam," you know, they're misinterpreting the Quran. No. Islam is a violent religious political ideology, and it is the fruit yes, behind is. why these people are doing what they're doing. It says very clearly in the Quran and in the Hadith literature and, and all the Islamic literature that Christians and Jews and those who are not Muslims are inferior, are, are to be persecuted, are to be, are, to, are to be extorted, and are to be murdered. And so this is a, this is the true fruit and face uh, of Islam. What we see in, in Nigeria, what we see in Pakistan, what we see all over the world in Muslim majority nations or in nations where there's a, a big Muslim contingency uh, or contingent, yes. a big, big Muslim contingent. So real quick, brother, I did want to ask this too. What is the, from what I've seen, um, the majority of people in Nigeria are Christians. There's actually more Christians than Muslims. Although there's, there's a, a pretty substantial Muslim minority. Absolutely, there is, the, the, yeah. the, the, the majority of people, yes, the, the Muslims are minorities, but you, you need to understand something. Like, when the British came and colonized Nigeria, uh, they, they, they received, what, what do you call it, the, 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 the Fulanis, the, the Fulanis and the Hausas were more receptive to the British than the Yorubas in the West and the Igbos in the, in the East. And, no. you know, it, it went on so, 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 so when the British were leaving, they secretly told the houses and the Fulanis that ruling Nigeria is their birthright and they want them to be the leaders. So the, the house of Fulanis believe that, you know, governance in Nigeria is their birthright. You see? Yes. So that disproportionate thing mm. makes them more vocal. They, they always help each other to put each push each other in places of authority. So you may, you may be mistaken to think that there are more in, in the population. That's why every almost every census, you know, in Nigeria census, in population census, at the end of the day, they, they don't show the this uh, the this uh, the, demogra the religious democracy demography. They don't show the religious demography, you know, because they don't want people to know exactly how many Muslims are in Nigeria and how many Christians are in Nigeria. But the fact is true that 55% of Nigeria are Christians and probably 40% are Muslims. Right. They're just a, a pretty vocal or visible minority. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So is there anything else, Brother uh, brother David, that you'd like to say before we end this dialogue, this interview? Anything you want to say to those who are like, going to tune in? Yes. I really like to appreciate you, Nick, I would like to appreciate the American public, the American Christians. I would like to appreciate the United States government for all the support, compassion that they have shown Africa. We really appreciate it, and we thank you. And we pray that God will continue to bless the United States of America and all Christian-loving believers all over the world. God bless you. We are really glad, and we are, we are grateful for all your love, your compassion, and your effort towards uh, helping us in our time of need. 
Okay guys, so the links that I mentioned before are gonna be in the description section of this video. Please uh, go over this video as many times as possible to memorize what you guys need to pray for, um, for our brothers and sisters in Nigeria, for Brother David, uh, for the United States and our government so that our government will take action to get the attention of the Nigerian government and to put an end to, in order to put an end to the horrible persecution of our brothers and sisters in Nigeria, which is ongoing and has been going on for a long time. But we know with the Lord, all things are possible with God, all things are possible, and we're going to forge ahead, we're going to pray, and I will be setting up my own um, fundraiser that's going to be ongoing for our brothers and sisters in Nigeria to also support uh, Brother David and the work that he's doing by the grace of God for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, with that said, folks, just uh, I'll leave you with the ironic benediction with a Christian spin. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May the Lord Jesus Christ make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord Jesus Christ lift up his countenance upon you and place his peace within you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory, shalom. And real quick, brother, um, I... I just thought of this. Would you like to share the gospel real quick for yes, for those who are going to, to tune into this? Because that's that's something I always like to end with. So why don't you do that and then we'll... I like, absolutely. I, I like everybody to know that Jesus, the Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord is the way, the truth, and the life. This world, it's, it's, uh, it's apparent and, uh, and evident that there is no hope in this world. There's no hope in money. There's no hope in politics. There's no hope in anything. The hope of humanity is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Jesus came and died for us. He died to set us free. He gave his life to give us inner peace, to give us the righteousness of God, to make us, uh, give us peace with God, reconcile us with the Father. And today Jesus still stands through all the ages being preached, and he still stands as the only source of peace for mankind. The only source of reconciliation with God. Every one of us must hear the gospel and make up our minds. You need to receive Jesus in your heart. Jesus shed his precious blood and he died for you. He died for me. This gospel is true. This gospel is life. You need to turn your life to Christ because Jesus paid a high price. And that price cannot be in vain. A day is coming when we will all stand before God and it will not be it will not be a, a, a dreadful day for you it should be a day of joy because you accepted the free gift of life of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord so this evening this day I want to invite you to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Jesus loves you he wants to save your life he wants to bless you you can pray this prayer if you really believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you want Jesus to come into your heart, you can just say this simple prayer with me. Father, I thank you. Your love and your compassion towards me is great. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Jesus died for me, not because I was good, but because you loved me. Today, I turn my life over to you. I receive you in my heart. Come into my heart. Save my life. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate this new life that I have in Christ, and I'm going to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, folks. So with that said, shalom in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful day.